Hey, Seth here with BlenderSensei.com. Today we're going to be talking about shader basics, or more specifically, the principled BSDF node. The principled BSDF node is Blender's main workhorse node. It's what generates most of the settings used to create materials in Blender. In fact, if we click on the Material tab of the Properties panel, and you come here under Surface, all of these default material settings you see here under the Surface menu are being generated from the Materials Principled BSDF node. So whenever you add a new material in Blender, it will always add two nodes. One, the Material Output node, and two is this Principled BSDF node. So with this default material selected, we could split this open and come over here and switch this to the Shader Editor. And here you can see everything composing this material. It's just this default basic principle BSDF node and the material output. So anything we change on here is going to change here and vice versa because this is just reading this data off from here. So if we were to change the color here, notice that it will change here. In fact, every single material that you see displayed here, these are all composed of a single node. These are just the effects of the principal BSDF node with the settings adjusted differently for each material. So part of why I'm making this video is that I've seen a lot of people online creating materials with like hundreds of nodes mixed and linked together and sometimes they're sort of getting the results they want or the results are kind of muddy or there seems like a a lot of unnecessary stuff going on to say the least and I think a part of all that unnecessary stuff going on is people not understanding how powerful this node is on its own by just mixing and matching its settings the kind of results you can get so once you really understand the power of the different kind of surfaces that you can generate with the principal BSDF node then you're far better equipped to start attaching procedural textures and other kinds of nodes to create really good looking materials. So in this video we're going to go over all these different basic settings so that as soon as you start attaching stuff to this node you have a far greater chance of actually making something really useful. So one quick caveat here is that while all of the different materials you see here can be generated with just this single node Actually, for all of these different materials, I'm using a slightly more complex setup, and I'll explain to you the exact ins and outs of that. The purpose being so that I can make changes to all of these materials all at once for my own testing purposes and also to demonstrate the different effects. So, for instance, all of these materials are using the same color except for this default one, which doesn't have anything else hooked up to it. But if we click on the no roughness one, You'll notice that there is a node group here called control and a displacement node. And the purpose of this control group is that if we click this button to go inside of the node group, we'll see that all that is here is a single RGB color node. And what groups allow us to do in Blender is create a group and then we can attach that group to different materials. But if we change something inside of the group, it will affect all of the different materials at the same time. So if I were to change this color here, we could change all of the materials colors, even though these are different materials with different principal BSDF nodes, I can change all of their color settings all at once, or I could add texture nodes and stuff like that in here, and those would show up here too. And then the displacement node is for later if we were to add textures to any of these nodes, we'd be able to see a 3D displacement on these materials, which we'll do a little bit later in this video. But neither the group nor this displacement node are necessary to achieve any of these effects. All of these effects can be done with just the principal BSDF node. So for instance, uh, if I click down here, on this transmission rough B material as we see we've got it I've got it labeled here's the material here I could delete its control so it's just using its basic color now and delete the displacement node and then give blender a second to recrunch all the shaders and it's still giving us the same exact results this is just set up so that we can make one change in one location and change it everywhere to experiment with the way that 
different colors or textures look across the whole range of possible settings with the BSCF node. So I'll go ahead and undo deleting those things because I want those things. And in fact, let's go ahead even for the default node, I'll go ahead and um, search for my control node. So by the way, it's really easy to do this, right? Like so, like say I had a, I don't know, a, a brick texture and I wanted this brick texture to go inside of a group and then have it to where I could put that group inside different materials so that one brick texture settings would affect all of the different materials. All you have to do is press Control G to make a group there. And then if you're using the power node add-on, which you can get for free at blendersensei.com, I highly recommend using that. You can just double click anywhere off the screen to get out of groups like that. Or if you're not using power node, you can get out of groups by pressing this button here will also get you out of groups. And then what you want to do is rename the node group here. Just call it, we could say this was brick group or something. And that changes. And then you can click on any different material and then go and then search for that node group you created like brick group. This is the thing we made and you add that group in and then you can attach that to different stuff in the material and then go inside and change these settings and then it will affect all the materials all over the place. So quick little uh, side tutorial on that. Okay, back to the default node here. I'm going to delete my silly little brick group thing and I'm going to reattach that base color so that this default is controlled along with everything else. And I'll go ahead and add a displacement node back. Just set that under here. And I had this connected to the height value. And then we'll want to connect the displacement to the displacement output of the material output. By the way, if you are using the power node add-on, power node has a lot of sweet features for automatically linking and adding things like displacement or a vector curve, stuff like that. But for demonstration and learning purposes, you may want to disable that stuff. So you can do that by pressing in to open up the settings here, coming down to maintenance. And if you come here and turn off this auto maintenance button, it will disable all auto maintenance features. You can also download this file for free from blendersensei.com if you want to follow along with this tutorial. It's also really useful just as a tool to start visualizing how these different shaders can work together and also test a bunch of stuff simultaneously like test different colors for these different shading styles uh, like this as I showed earlier as well as we could add a say a noise texture or some other kind of texture here get rid of that and then you'll have to wait a second because blender's figuring out how this texture should apply to all these different materials and different bsdf nodes if you're using power node you could add a color ramp by pressing r and then this lets us test how a single node or a couple of nodes or a couple of textures or some idea we had works for all these different surface display types. We could adjust this uh, color ramp here. We could add a lot more detail in the noise, bring the scale down. Increase the roughness and adjust these ramps. And you can very quickly start seeing how different procedural nodes will affect different surface types using this sweet little setup. So this is totally free and you can get it from blendersensei.com. Okay, so let's go ahead and get rid of this and well I guess now that that color is in the group output I don't need to add a mix RGB I can just keep that and will that change everything sweet cool okay so I don't even need to worry about adding another RGB node it just stays there all right cool so let me double click out of that so this is basically where we were at the beginning of the video and now let's get to discussing these different settings
the different caveats, for instance, some things like anisotropic you can only use while in cycles, and so on. Okay, so we shouldn't really need this shader editor for the rest of the video since all of these are just generated from adjusting the principal BSDF node settings. So I'm going to click up here, drag right, and get rid of that. Over here in the top right corner of the outliner, you may have noticed I have these different set of collections. So these are used to segment up these different categories of things that you can do by adjusting the settings of the BSDF node. So first up we have a display of roughness. So I'm going to go ahead and click on all of these eyes to hide everything. Don't want to hide the stage there. And let's take a look at this first default material. So if I click on it, this brings it up here over in the material tab. And I'm going to drag this up a little bit so we can have a little bit of a better view of this surface menu here. So the default material is just kind of like this basic matte material. If we click on roughness, you can see really the only thing I've changed is dropping the roughness from 0.5 to zero here. So roughness, slider changes things from the super shinies to the more matte look okay so moving down we have subsurface stuff let's go ahead and hide the roughness material stuff and show the subsurface material stuff subsurface short for subsurface scattering is referring to the way in which light does not just immediately bounce off of an object, but is absorbed into an object, scatters around, but the object or the material is transparent enough that it's going to scatter the light and send some of it back out. So it's not exactly absorbing and not exactly uh, reflecting the light, but taking it in, doing a little something with it, and then spitting it back out. So this brings us to a part of the discussion that's really important. Blender has three different main render engines. And we can take a look at those by clicking on the render tab. And right now we are in cycles, but we are in the material viewport of cycles, which is more or less the same as the EV render engine. So cycles is the most resource heavy on your computer and the render engine that takes the longest to render. So it's kind of at the top tier of realism and cool things that Blender can do. Up here are different viewport shading modes in Blender. So you have wireframe, solid viewport shading, material viewport shading, and then render preview. So if we click render preview, this is the cycles engine actually at work. And you'll see it's very slow, but it starts delivering really amazing looking results. And even more amazing in a minute when we turn on some lights behind our Suzanne heads with subsurface scattering on them. You can see I have it set to only do 16 samples so that we can get a decent looking view really quickly while working with these materials. And I also, under denoise, I have this start sample set to 16. Typically you want these samples to be the same or else you're gonna have a really kind of clunky chugging experience. An interesting thing to note about when you are in Cycles Render Engine is that effectively material viewport shading is the EV render engine and solid viewport shading is the workbench render engine. The purpose of changing these render engines is so that you can actually render, that is go to render and then render image or render your animation. But when it comes to just testing or viewing things, you basically have access to all three of these engines while you are in cycles, viewing them anyway. This is essentially Eevee. And this is essentially the workbench engine. If we click on the viewport shading tab here, we have, while we are in solid viewport shading, we have these options like turning on shadow, turning on cavity, adjusting uh, these values here. So if you wanted to do renders, if you wanted to render things like this, you would switch this engine to workbench. And actually this wouldn't render like this the shadow and the cavity here, so we'd want to disable it. But you still can render like an animation or a still frame like that if you wanted by changing this to the workbench engine and then turning on shadow here. But then we'd want to be in, <laughs> it get, all gets a little convoluted, but we would want to be in the render preview of the workbench engine. That is to say, 
what our stuff will look like when we actually render this image or render an animation. And then you could adjust the shadow values here, um, the cavity values as, as I was doing before. And then you could render this out. But if you don't intend to render using the Workbench engine, which is basically just solid viewport shading, then you can stay in cycles and use what is effectively Eevee to navigate quickly when while looking at materials, but not quite as realistic as cycles or in the solid viewport shading, which is the same as the Workbench engine. Okay, so here back in cycles, I'll switch back to material viewport shading. That was all to say that there are differences in the way Blender represents the same settings for a material for the principal BSDF node in the different render engines or material viewport shading modes. And it's kind of unfortunate because for some of these, you just have to be aware of them ahead of time. For instance, here in Eevee or the cycles material viewport shading, which uses the EV render engine. When subsurface scattering is used in the material, we'll click back to the material tab like it is here. We will get some pseudo effects on the object using the material itself, but this will not allow for light to pass through and do the kind of stuff that subsurface scattering normally does. So for instance, here in the subsurface collection, I have a couple of point lamps and we can enable them by pressing these I buttons here and here in material viewport shading which is essentially uh, EV render engine so that's essentially well it's the same as here as it is here more or less the render preview and material viewport shading while you're in EV are basically the same but in either case we're not able to see any of this light coming through, such as areas behind the ear where you would see the subsurface effects. I'll switch that back to material viewport shading and head back over to cycles. However, if we were to change this to render preview viewport shading, give this a minute to create some samples, we can see this area of Suzanne's ear looks reddish because of the subsurface scattering happening inside in this area where the ear is a lot thinner than the rest of Suzanne's face. So this is only going to happen while in render preview, cycles render preview, or rendering the scene with cycles. So if we switch to material preview, you'll notice that you don't get any of the actual effects of lights from the environment actually scattering inside of the objects. Quick note, when you are in Cycles Render Preview, viewport shading like this, you wanna make sure that scene world is disabled. And what this will do is allow for Blender's built-in studio light to be used while you're experimenting with materials and testing stuff out, which is a really good generic lighting space. If this is checked, which it is by default, then you'll have this gray, harsh, nasty looking default world that Blender comes with here. And uh, it's not good for anything without adding an HDR image or adjusting it in some way. So make sure this is set to scene lights or remain on if you want to see the effects of lights in the scene and the scene world is disabled. Unfortunately, even with this disabled, you can't render your image using the studio lighting. So the image will still render using the scene world setup. So if you wanted to imitate this lighting, you would want to find a similar HDR to the one you are using from the studio preview set and then load that in here. Another note about all these subsurface materials we're using here, we have these set to the Christensen Burley option. By default, they're set to random walk, which can technically deliver more realistic results, but also can cause weird coloration in areas where there's overlapping uh, bits of mesh and stuff. If you have a very simple object like a candle or a, a cylinder shape, you may be able to get better results with these uh, random walk settings. However, it could sabotage more complicated objects like a human body or a face or something like that. So typically I leave this on Christensen Burley. You can increase the amount of subsurface scattering here, basically let more light in to do its thing. 
but if you want to just increase it you can increase it like this now you can see much more light is bleeding through and much less of the original pigmentation remains here so as kind of a way to counterbalance that we have this subsurface color value here we could adjust the color to be something closer to what our original color was and I could go into the shader editor and get the actual color but who got time for that okay so we could have like something like that to offset the color and so now we have a much more intense subsurface scattering effect but we've managed to retain a similar color throughout the material once again all this inner stuff here is only going to show up in cycles render preview mode or when you actually go to render the image or animation this will not show up in the material preview ie ev okay so we changed the subsurface color because we wanted to offset the subsurface scattering effect but we're still getting this basic red interior scattering this is controlled by the subsurface radius value here and it's cut off a little bit but that's what it says and these three values are red green and blue we're getting this inner red scattering because we have red set to one well this is these are the default values but we could set the green value to one we could set this value to the red value to 0.1 and leave blue at 0.1 so now green is super high so we're going to get some creepy uh, green scattering going on inside <laughs> that's a, a pretty intense uh, green scattering going on in there maybe we'll drop that down a little bit and we could return the subsurface color to back to white because now that our we're not the subsurface scattering value is not so intense we shouldn't be losing general pigmentation as much we're still losing some but the red is more aiding in these other two which the materials have not been adjusted of keeping its color than the green scattering is we can take a look at the rest of this in material preview and I'm going to open this up and disable these uh, point lights because that part of the demonstration is over okay so the rest of these are just a demonstration of different shader settings you can do on the principal BSDF with subsurface scattering to get different kind of results so here is subsurface scattering with no roughness so if we click on that we'll see I have the roughness set all the way to zero but you can see what happens as we increase it it gets similar to that this is can be really useful for making things like butter wax a greased up pig <laughs> And then we have subsurface with clear coat. So here we have roughness at roughly 0.5, but this could be all the way up and we would still see this kind of shine. The clear coat creates an additional reflective layer. This can be used to visually communicate like a film layer on something, like a layer of wax or plastic on something covering something that is not as reflective. So the clear coat value is down here, and I'll increase the regular roughness some. Clear coat value is down here, you can see removing that. And the clear coat's effectiveness will be better displayed when we get to the metallic materials, but we'll see that in a second. All right, let's hide the subsurface stuff and move on to metallic. So I'll click open the metallic here. Let's take a one that says metallic no rough first. So I'll click on that and we can see its settings. All I've done here to different from the default material is increase this metallic slider up from zero all the way to one. This is what it looks like for that, which is essentially uh, just the no roughness material that we displayed earlier where I just turned all the roughness down. In general, you will be advised to set this metallic value to one all the way or zero because typically any kind of dimming or fading of the material or stuff like that should be handled with other values like roughness and stuff like that there are some interesting things you can do by mixing this metallic value like i think dropping this metallic value a bit and if we go ahead and open the shader editor if this were white 
This kind of looks like a pearl. <laughs> we would also want to add some subsurface scattering to that. But there are a few interesting things you can do by mixing these values of metallic. But typically, if you're going for making something actually metal, you want this to be one, and then you want to handle the fading or rusting or other effects of that in other ways and just let that be one. And I'll switch us back to our more gold yellowy color we got going on here. So the metallic clear coat, this is with the metallic value set all the way up to one, but then we also have roughness up to 0.5 and we have clear coat set all the way up to one and we're using the clear coat to create the illusion of like a layer of lacquer or wax or something like that on top of the more matte color beneath it. Then metallic rough, this is just an example of how you should be um, fading your metal using the roughness value as opposed to setting this metallic value to some lower level. So here we just have the roughness up to 0.25, just kind of a quick demonstration of that. Of course you can add in textures and things to each any of these values to do stuff, so a good place to do that is at roughness. So you can use that to create like worn areas of the metal. And then over here we have an isotropic displays. Note here that this tells us that cycles render preview and render only. So an isotropic effects are not visible at all. No matter how much you think they might be, they are not visible in material viewport shading, i.e. EV or the EV render engine. Not at the time of me talking. Of course they will be made that way the day after this video is released, but as of now they're not. So similar to the full effects of the subsurface scattering, to see any of the effects of the anisotropic areas of this the principal BSDF shader, we need to be in cycles render preview mode or actually render the image. So let's go to render preview mode and since we're in the cycles engine, uh, we'll be able to see it. So here the anisotropic rotation is set to zero and here you can see it's going uh, vertically uh, with the rotation set to 0.25 and you can see when I click on this object here using that material I have the anisotropic value set all the way up to one and the rotation which is cut off a little here but is set to zero and the purpose of this is to create the effect of brushed metal or metal pressed in a way that creates a kind of banding. Of course this doesn't create very detailed effects of that, it's just kind of a general broad effect of lighting. To really create brushed metal you need to invoke some other nodes, which we will get into that into a later video. So using the anisotropic effects with some more additional nodes can be useful to create brushed metal materials. But here you can see if I were to adjust this rotation value, you can kind of see that rotate. That's kind of like at a diagonal angle here. And we can decrease the effect. So it's doing less stretching. But it's another one of those things where it's more or less useful at one or zero. Okay, let's disable the metallic and I'm going to enable transmission A and let's go ahead and switch back to material viewport shading. All right, so even in material viewport shading, i.e. EV, the principal BSDF node is capable of delivering some really amazing results. As you can see, it's like live reflecting the checkered environment behind it and distorting it and that's really interesting looking. So transmission is basically used to create glass effects, which look very good in EV and in cycles. So once again, let's start with this one here, where this one is called transmission, no roughness, A. Uh, and these are all A because I have similar materials, or actually they're all the same materials, but with the IOR index of refraction values increased. So you can kind of get a basic idea of what all of these same shading effects look like when you increase the IOR value. And we'll look at these a little bit closer in a minute. But it's pretty interesting how changing the IOR value can change all these shading effects. We'll hide that for now. Okay, 
So this is just the basic material, but with transmission set all the way up to one, if we bring it all the way down, and also roughness set to zero. <laughs> so this is my no roughness lane, and this is my clear coat lane. Uh, and all of this is set up in a way to hopefully it kind of gives your brain a bird's eye view of slight variations of changing these shading settings and how they work together and how they mold together to give you a broader sense of adjusting these settings and when you're actually hooking up different texture nodes to these different things having a deeper understanding of how they're going to meld together and make stuff but this is the same as this the no roughness one up here uh, which we could take a look at by clicking this these are the same except for the transmission value here is brought all the way up to one here we have the same thing but with roughness remaining at 0.5 so this is actually just this with the transmission value all the way up to one as you can see those are the same and then this is just that but with an added clear coat or a layer of lacquer wax whatever you want to think about some clear film thing over something that's not reflective to give us this kind of effect here so you can see we've got roughness at 0.5 clear coat at 1 and transmission all the way up with the clear coat we also have this option for clear coat roughness so you can add a little bit of roughness or you could use a texture node such as noise texture or Musgrave or Voronoi or something like that to create patches of this clear lacquer by plugging it into the roughness so it would like kind of create a mask. And this is short for transmission, transmission roughness. So in addition to clear coat roughness, regular roughness, we also have transmission roughness. So here I have transmission all the way up to one but the roughness up to 0.5. And this way we're kind of clouding the inner workings of our transmission while leaving the outside completely reflective and shiny with the default roughness value. We could do a similar thing with the clear coat if we wanted for uh, another kind of effect. And here is transmission used with subsurface effects, which is great for creating things like jello or bone marrow or anything goopy and slimy uh, where you need it to be something more gelatin like and because this is using uh, subsurface scattering it's also going to display slightly differently in cycles it should do more cool looking stuff than when it's just in material viewport shading ie ev actually probably with this sphere probably not so much because the sphere is a one continuous mass so there's not like some thinner part of here and then some bulkier part where we could see the light coming through to do something more interesting. But you can tell there's a little bit of a difference. It looks a little more gelatin in cycles. So we'll switch that back to material viewport shading. And we'll go ahead and enable transmission B one more time. So this is just all the same transmission effects, but with an adjusted IOR value different glass-like things, different crystals, different plastics, all the different things that are clear and see-through, water, have different ways that they bend light, and those different ways of bending light can be adjusted with the IOR value index of refraction, like this. There are lists on the internet of specific IOR values for the different type of things like water versus plastic versus crystal versus glass and if you're going for hyper realism you can look those up okay I'm going to disable roughness and the transmission materials and let's enable the emission materials so emission refers to light or glowing basically and we have several examples of this so with the first emission one we actually have the emission or the light value set to be controlled by our control group, which allows us to adjust one color to change everything all at once. So here you see we have that going into the emission node. If we cut this line here, then we could change this color to whatever we wanted, or we could change the main control uh, inside the group, the color here, and change everything. 
But when the emission value is set to black, that basically means it's not going to emit any color, so that's what it is by default. So to get it to emit color, the first thing you do is just change that emission color, and then you can control the strength value to whatever you want. You can increase that, decrease it. Another quick thing to note is that most of these values are set up to be zero to one, but you can increase them a lot higher if you desire for more artistic freedom by clicking on something and like typing in eight instead of uh, its normal limitation if you just use the mouse to drag it of zero to one. So we have emission strength of 25. We could lower that a lot. Over here, we have an example where we have lowered the alpha value. This is another one of those material settings where there's a bit of a caveat between cycles and EV, or i.e. Um, material cycles material preview and cycles material render preview. So I'm able to see some of the alpha effects here in material preview, i.e. EV, because I have a setting adjusted for this material here in the viewport display. I have the blend mode set to alpha hashed. I think by default it's opaque, which means you can't see any of its effects at all. I don't know why they would do that. I don't know why they would set that to default being opaque. But you can, so you can at least get a representation of what that looks like in the viewport. But obviously it's going to look a lot better when it's actually rendered. And then over to the right here, we have an example of mixing these two things. So decreasing the alpha value and increasing the emission. So we have the alpha value lowered from 1 to 0.25. And we have the emission strength up at 10. And we have our color here, uh, this color here, controlling the emission color. There are also a few other settings I have enabled for EV which are making my stuff look good in the cycles material viewport shading as well as for EV render. So if we click on the render tab and we switch this to EV, you want to make sure bloom is enabled, ambient occlusion, and screen space reflections. And really what you want to do is have these always enabled all the time. So you should, when you're done with this video or whatever, uh, open up a new fresh instance of Blender, and once you've uh, start restarted Blender, come here under the render settings, enable this, this, and this, and then go to File, Default, Save Startup File, and then every time you use Blender, you'll see all these nice effects, and as much reflection, ambient occlusion, lighting and glow stuff that the EV render engine can do while rendering an EV or while viewing things in material viewport shading, which is a lot faster when working uh, with actual objects and things in Cycles Render. Okay, so let's hide the emission stuff and display sheen stuff. For the sheen materials, I have two simple cloth objects I made to kind of demonstrate the sheen effects. And let's switch this color to, let's make this into a nice uh, red. What sheen allows us to do, as you can see here in the material or here in the material tab of the properties panel, we have sheen set to 10. Now to get this value to 10, I had to click in here and manually type in 10, otherwise it will only let you drag it to one. And this creates kind of a velvety fuzz around your material. So it's good for things like cloth, where you want to demonstrate velvet or some kind of fuzz uh, or something like that. This is another interesting thing to use texture nodes to create a mask or to disrupt some areas of this. And over here, you can see I have sheen mixed with uh, subsurface. Here I have subsurface value increased from zero to 0.25 and the sheen all the way up and this could be useful when you want to make something organic or leathery like a pig skin or something like that that also has very tiny fuzzy hairs <laughs> all across it that are not visible unless you zoomed in really really closely it can help with lighting of uh, organic leathers and stuff like that okay I'm going to disable that and enable uh, my very basic roughness metals I mean materials up here which now look red because we changed all the colors of everything to red. 
And let's cover a few things that we didn't go over specifically because honestly they're not things that I use often. So we didn't change the specular value, but we can click on this here and we can adjust the specular value here. This controls the specularity. The specular value is another one of those things if you're going for hyperrealism, it's possible to adjust this value to match different IOR values of things like asphalt or stone or whatever to get the right specularity. Typically I find it's fine to eyeball this or leave this at 0.5 because specularity is not what I want to change. It's usually the level of reflectiveness or something like that, but this can help fine tune hyperrealism. And then you have specular tint, which controls how much of that specularity should be sh shaded with the rest of the material. So if it's all the way up to one, then that specularity is going to be completely controlled by the base color of the material. If it's all the way at zero, it's going to be white. And typically, wherever you see the different tint things, like specular tint or sheen tint, this is really what this means is blend that thing, like sheen or specularity, how much to blend that with the material's base color. So once again, with the uh, sheen material examples here, where that sheen tint is set to zero, it's going to create a much stronger vivid effect. And if we bring it all the way up to one, the lighting is completely reflective of the base color. So it's, it's just a mixed value between that base color and white whenever you see tint on something. Let's go ahead and re-enable all these. And I'm going to go ahead and close this up. So I hope you've enjoyed this video on Shader Basics. Once again, you can download this file free at blendersensei.com. It can be a really useful reminder of how these basic shading settings can be manipulated to do different things, as well as a useful tool to just test out mixing different texture nodes together and seeing what they all do on these different surfaces all at once. In the next couple of videos in this series, we're going to start diving into making some really awesome procedurally generated materials and I'm excited to show you that. So please subscribe if you're not subscribed. Please like this video if it helped you and please share it on Facebook, Twitter, all the things that you're on. And that would help me out a ton. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.